Welcome to the All About Scentwork podcast. In this podcast, we talk about all things scentwork. That can include training tips, a behind the scenes look at what your instructor or trial official is going through, and much more. In this episode, I have the distinct privilege of speaking with Lori Timberlick of Do Over Dog Training about a very important topic, potentially having to retire your dog from scentwork. Before we start diving into the episode itself, let me do a very quick introduction of myself. My name is Diana Santos. I'm the owner and lead instructor of Setwork University. This is an online dog training platform where we provide online courses, seminars, webinars, and eBooks that are all centered around Setwork. So regardless of where you are in your Snippy journey, you're just getting started, you're looking to develop some more advanced skills, you're interested in trialing, or you're already trialing in the upper levels, we likely have a training solution for you. So I should know a little bit more about me, let's dive into the episode itself. So once again, I have the very distinct privilege of speaking with Lori Timberlick of Do Over Dog Training for this episode, talking about a really important topic as Lori shares her story about having to retire her dog from nose work. All right, let's dive into that conversation. So I want to thank you so very much for joining us. We are delighted to be having you again for one of our podcast interviews. And you had mentioned that you wanted to talk about something that's near and dear to your heart, and that is coming to the realization that you may need to retire your nose work dog. And I think that this is going to be a really helpful episode for many of our listeners who may be in the same boat for a variety of different reasons. So I first of all want to thank you for sharing this because again, it can be you know a very difficult thing to go through. But I do think that's going to be helpful for everyone to realize that we all can come to this position and that it'll just be helpful to talk about. So again, I really do sincerely want to thank you for sharing because this is, again, it's emotional. (laughs) So did you want to talk to us a little bit about how you have come to this potential decision, this crossroads that you're at with your own pup and what you're going through, what you're thinking about? You just want to let us know what that whole journey is like. You know, Daisy has been retired for a little bit. Um, I think we did a trial 2022. We did some elements. But things have been hitting me more a little bit more recently, and we can get into that a little bit. But I'll just talk about why we retired her. She's still, like, her stamina is still amazing. She's still healthy. She's 14. Uh, We did a seven-mile hike followed by a three-mile hike this weekend. (laughs) So, (laughs) like, she's got all that going on. But she just, I'm not going to say she doesn't like scent work anymore, but she'd rather run in the woods. And so why make her go do this thing? And she loved competing when we were competing and she liked playing for fun when we were playing for fun. But now she's just like, meh, like I got other things I could be sniffing trees right now. So it has been difficult knowing that I have a dog that can do it, that just doesn't want to do it. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there with really young dogs that they got a dog just to do scent work. And the dog's like, eh. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I'll I'll do it if you want me to, but this really isn't my thing, you know? Right. And then I'm sure there's a lot of people, you know, with older dogs or dogs with illnesses or dogs that, you know, physically can't do it anymore that are going through the same thing. So that's, you know, that was kind of how I made the decision with Daisy was when I started seeing that she just didn't care anymore. And like I said, we still play for fun sometimes, but even then she's not as interested. So I could tell a quick story. Because I had two things happen recently that kind of made me think of, I was just thinking of ideas for podcasts and I'm like, you know, I'm really feeling it lately, how much I miss trialing and how hard it is for me to not go to trials, mm-hmm. um, even though my dog could care less, right? So we um, dropped into a nose work class a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of my instructors was having class at a brewery. So it's like my dreams come true, sniffing and being at a brewery <laughs> and She had a spot left. Usually those classes fill super fast and she had a spot open. And I said, why not? I'm going to bring Daisy. It'll be fun. Um, I wanted to see the place because I was having a class there the following week. So I thought, you know, this would be a good, good time to go check it out and see what I've got available to me. And uh, I put her harness on. We always used a harness for scent work and, you know, told her, find it, which she can't hear me anymore. So that didn't really mean anything. And she just kind of moseyed around. It was like, cool. We're in a new place. And she wasn't sniffing, even though she had the harness on, even though she can't hear me, she, she knew what she was there to do. And so once we got her to a hide, then she was like, Oh, okay. All right. We're doing that nose work thing. 
And and then she did fine. She found all the rest of the hides. She actually did a pretty good job. There's some elevated hides, some close hides, things that we really don't work on that much. And then she was like, all right, can we just chill now? <laughs> like she just, we were like driving by parks on the way home and she got really excited. Like, are we going to a park now? And I'm like, no, you just sniff for an hour. And that just really like hit home to me. Like I had so much fun doing that. It was so exciting for me. It was kind of scary um, doing blind hides. I could have asked, I mean, I did ask for the first one because she was having a hard time, but I just wanted to see like, where did I lose my chops? Like, did I forget what I'm doing? I can watch thousands of dogs every week, you know, sniff. But then when I'm doing it, my, am I losing my skills because I'm not trialing or even training anymore? So all these emotions were hitting me like, do I need to get another dog? Do I need to bring her out more? Do I need to find a different dog to, to train with? So all these things were going through my mind from that class. So um, that was kind of the first thing that hit me was how much I miss it and how nervous I am about missing, missing out on fun and missing out on skills and training, right? As an instructor, and not everybody out there is an instructor, but I'm sure everyone has those thoughts. Look, I haven't sniffed in so long that I forgot what I'm doing. I forgot what this end of the leash is supposed to do. I was worried that there was one hide that was inaccessible. And I saw her working it and I'm like, I think there's something there. But uh, then my, I'm second guessing myself, like, did I forget how to do this? <laughs> did oh, I geez. forget how to read my own dog? <laughs> right. And then I asked, I'm like, is there something here? And she said, yeah, it's inaccessible. And that it made me feel better. But, you know, all these, all these weird different thoughts were going through my head as we were doing those searches of not only the sadness of not trialing, but you know, stuff from the, the handler side too. So I don't know, do you, <laughs> I have, I have more stories, but do you have anything to add there or any thoughts to any of that? First of all, thank you again for sharing that because it's so <laughs> relatable on so many levels, right? You have the, the handler level of, I have a dog. We've been doing this for a bit. Now we haven't been doing it for a little bit. Oh my God, have I forgotten what I'm doing to the added level of stress of as an instructor that not only are you an instructor, but you're the owner of your business. You're at one of your instructor's classes. You're in front of all their clients and you're like, okay, what happened? Do I, did I forget everything that I've done? <laughs> and all of that is so relatable, right? And it's something I think that all of us struggle with at some point and add it on top of the, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Oh my God, my dog is going we're, we're our whole thing about our program is building enthusiasm and love for the game. And oh, they love it. And my dog is like, eh, do we have some trees that we can sniff? Can yeah. we go to a park instead? It's like, what is happening right now? <laughs> so I, I completely relate to all these things. Can you talk about what it is that you saw before this class that made you think that she was like, I would much rather go for hikes right now. The last, like that last trial we went to, it was a weird trial. It was hot. We had to drive to all of our searches. It was a lot in one weekend. And she just wasn't having fun. She wasn't excited. And a lot of that was not just that she was sick of playing scent work, but the the other stuff happening. And I, I'm always really sad that that was our last trial because it was just a big bummer. She came home with one title, um, but we were entered in three different trials. And it was, yeah, that trial, even though there were other things involved, I was just like, she's not having fun. And I think that's a really good thing for us to maybe talk about a little bit more is, do you think that she was already on a trajectory of like, I really am kind of done with, oh, let me ask this. Were you also seeing any kind of dip in even her practice sessions or was this more of a delineation of, well, I can do it for fun, but I don't want to do a whole trial day. Yeah. It, and this is weird. And this is probably a little different from a lot of dogs because a lot of, you know, the first thing when dogs get older, they're like, well, you know, you, you don't have to trial them or they shouldn't be trialing. Daisy is sort of the exception. And I had a student that had a border collie who was 15 running NW3. And she had another instructor at the time and she was coming to me for private lessons. The other instructor said, you know, maybe you shouldn't be trialing this dog. This dog was active this dog was doing awesome they ended up getting two nw3s before he did pass away from something sudden um so she does normally i would say enjoy the trial day um 
I don't think it was that she. And again, I can't get in my dog's head and I don't want to put things on her, but I think she was a, a rare dog that liked going to trials. She would get super excited as everybody knew that was parked near me. Um, <laughs> she was at a trial. Um, and, but yeah, we, and we never really practiced a ton, but yeah, the few practice sessions, like she was a little slower and not because of any mobility issues or anything like that or age. It was just like more of a boredom, more of a, there's, I, there's, and maybe because I was walking her so much and we were doing so much at the park that she's like, oh, I didn't know we could do this all the time. Right. <laughs> like, this is way fun. So, I, yeah, I mean, I was seeing it a little bit before that trial, but then that trial, I was like, that's it. And it, it, like I said, it's not an age thing. It was a, I don't care about this anymore kind of thing. Right. And so for the people who are listening to that, be like, okay. But I really, really, really wanted my dog and myself to do this, particularly in their golden years, because as you mentioned, it is very important for the human too. Yeah. Should I then be putting in the efforts to rebuild the dog's enthusiasm in what they're doing? Or should I be listening to what my dog is saying and make that shift for them? This is an impossible so, question that I'm asking you. No, I think that's, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to give you an answer. Right, I know. <laughs> I, I think it is, you know, you have to honor your dog. And maybe, like, if we didn't have, like, maybe I wasn't mobile and we couldn't do these hikes in the woods, which I don't know, tomorrow I may not be, but especially the way she drags me through the woods. If we didn't have other things to do, then maybe I would say, you know what, I'm going to get the best treats ever. I'm going to do simpler searches and we're just going to have a lot of fun with this, but I don't have a ton of time. So if we're going to spend time together, I think it's mutually beneficial for our team to spend that time hiking in the woods, where maybe for somebody else, it would make more sense to make nose work more fun and right more um doable for for a dog that is kind of slipping and just doesn't you know is getting bored because a lot of dogs are getting bored for other reasons right, right. Uh, people go up in the higher levels they're not rewarding as much they're making everything hard they're stressed all the time so there are different reasons for this right but if it's something like you know an age thing or a, a health issue then yeah i think you you try it right um, see what happens. What if you make it super exciting with the best treats ever and you have a party every time they find the hide? You might get some more enthusiasm back. And maybe even if you're not trialing, you could still play the game for fun, for sure. So for people who may be more in where you are now, where the dog mm -hmm. has clearly said, oh, we are doing this walking thing. That is just awesome. <laughs> the sniffing thing was fun for, you know, the majority of my time on this planet. But I really want to go drag you through the woods <laughs> <laughs> and the person is going, well, that's all fine and dandy. And I would love to spend this time with you, pup. But there's this other thing that we were doing for such a long period of time that I thought was really fun too. Um, how could they then as the person divorce their strong emotions that they have with that activity with what the dog is saying? So how are you coping with that as far as okay, I, I went to this class, all these emotions happened. Clearly I'm missing this. And now I am nervous about, okay, well, I'm, is there an attrition to what my skill set is? What do I need to do? Do I now need to get another dog? Like all these are really heavy emotions and thoughts. How are you yeah. coping with that? So, and then I'll tell my second story that happened in the same week. And it's still, it, is it the answer? I don't, I don't think so. So because I will say, uh, you know, right now getting another dog is not on my list of things to do. I just, I, it, I'm not getting a second dog. So it's going to be a little while or a third dog. I, should say. <laughs> I always forget about poor Chewy. <laughs> <laughs> poor Chewy. And we could, we could talk about her in a little bit too, because I, I have, so here's a solution here. You know, I can play more with her, but I'll get back to that in a second. So the second thing that happened, so my business just had, this was so fun. Um, we ran a nose work league this summer. So every Saturday we'd have a different location with a different theme and all these teams came and we added a little competition to it with prizes. So you got a little bit of trial stress, but really they were just like, you know, regular 
yeah, like classes, but a little bit more exciting with a little more edge to them. Mm -hmm. And I had some of my instructors fill in at different ones so that I wouldn't have to run all of them. And one of the weeks that I wasn't running a bit, running the league, someone asked me, we, we allowed alternates, right? So we had a bunch of people that couldn't do the whole league, but they could do certain weeks. So you could have an alternate play for your team. And um, someone asked me to be an alternate with this private lesson dog that I run that he's an interesting, it's an interesting situation. His owner is older and she's not mobile. So we've just been playing 100% for enrichment for the last year. Um, she brings him in. I walk him. I set the hides. I run him. I reward him. He runs back to his mom and then I move the hides and then I run him again. So like I literally run for <laughs> a half hour to 45 <laughs> minutes straight. And we have literally done a year's worth of all known hides, um, but we do everything. Like I've done everything with him that we do in all the other classes. And recently someone else just ran him in an ORT and he did awesome. And so they asked me to run him at league. And I was like, sure, let's see what happens. Like, hopefully I can read because I've got all these doubts in my head after Daisy's class, right? Do I even know right. what I'm doing anymore? And I, it was so fun. It was speed searches. So it was four speed searches in a row and we came in third place. He did amazing. <laughs> so now I've got all these, like, that was so fun. Oh my God, I missed this so much. Now do I go out and get a search? <laughs> you know, what do I do? Like, do I ask to run him again? Um, and me and the owner had talked about it before, but, you know, she's not going to travel, you know, two, three hours to go to a trial and she wants to see him. It's not like I'm just going to take him and go. Right. Um, that's not an option. Um, so we talked about maybe some local trials or things like that. And still, is that the answer? Like for me, for the training side of it, to make sure that I can read a dog, <laughs> which it's silly <laughs> that I'm saying that with all of the training that I do, but it's different when you're the one holding the leash and you're the one that's, you know, behind the dog and not watching at a distance, knowing where all the hides are, right? You know, that brought a whole new set of emotions of excitement, happiness, and then sadness again of darn, I miss going to trials. Right. Um, but that is, you know, if you have a friend or maybe if you still are involved with your nose work group, you know, ask someone if you can run their dog every once in a while, even if it's just in class, just to get those feelings of that was super fun. Yes, I still know how to read a dog and practice your leash handling. That could be an option if anybody was willing to do that. Maybe somebody has two dogs and they can't always handle both dogs in class. Ask if you can handle their second dog. Like that's an option, even in trials. And after that happened, people were like, well, you can run my dog in a trial. I'm like, I don't want to get in the business of running other people's dogs in trials. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it it could be fun. It, you know, it, I know some people like they just want the titles and they don't care if they're the one running the dog or not. So certainly I'm sure there's people out there that would love for someone else to run their dog. So, yeah, that was kind of the another way for me to, I guess, just more emotions, but <laughs> another way for me to get involved was to run somebody else's dog. And then that's really been making me think more. And everyone's like, well, you have another dog. Why don't you run her? She's not really trial appropriate, but she loves playing the game. So that made me get in the car, take her out, set some hides, even though I don't always have time for her. I'm like, guess what? You get a turn today. And that was really fun watching her search, even though I'm still missing that trial part because I can't take her to a trial. I got to, you know, I knew where the hides were because I was the one that set them, but I still got to practice running a dog on difficult hides. So that was another option. And I guess I'll, I'll pause there for a second if you had more thoughts or questions. And I think that it's really good that you're laying out all these important things that you're going through as far as, okay, this is where we are with our journey with Daisy. I have this other dog, Chewy. We can't just go into a trial because she wouldn't be appropriate. It wouldn't be a good experience for her or for the other competitors. It would stress me out. Yeah. <laughs> All of those things, right, are very important things to consider because I'm sure there are plenty of people who are in the same boat where they do have multiple dogs. They had their dog that was trial appropriate, that they were happy and they were successful in trialing and now they're at the same kind of point in their journey where maybe that journey is ending they have dog number two or three or four and yeah. those dogs for whatever reason it wouldn't be okay for them to trial it wouldn't be a good idea for them to trial and 
to many outside observers be like, well, just rinse and repeat, like just tag that other dog in and go if this is so important to you. So I really tip my hat to you to recognize that that may not be the best idea, but playing the game with her and making that time is really important too. Speaking of, you know, cyber scent work, the NACSW skills challenge. So I really keep telling myself, I think I sent in a couple cyber scent works and I never, and they were like totally unprepared, like just threw her out there. But like, if I really wanted to work on my chops and really like, am I doing, you know, having someone else watch me, that would, I really am thinking about that as doing more cyber scent work with Chewy so that someone else can say, hey, did you know you do this? Hey, did you know? So it'd be a good way, even though we're not traveling and going to a trial and being in the trial atmosphere, that's another way to just have someone watch me and say, yes, you're doing this really good. Maybe you should work on that to keep my trialing chops going, I guess. So that is on my list of things to do. And hopefully you get some some uh, submissions from me soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, with all the <laughs> infinite time that you have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, but I think that's another part of this puzzle, right? And it's something that I've been talking or touching upon in some of our latest episodes of blog posts and things is the the element of time, the element yeah. of people are spread so incredibly thin. And that's especially true for all of my colleagues. You in particular, my dear, are just doing a million and one things at once. And all of it is to support this network community, which is amazing, but at the same point, like sleep. So I, I completely understand the fact of saying, okay, I need, or I would like to do these things, but with what time? <laughs> And now right. I need to rearrange everything. And then that's another layer of emotions of frustration of not having that time, feeling guilty for somehow magically not having 30 hours in the day uh, <laughs> and all of this other stuff. So do you want to talk about some of those things for a second is how are you coping with that as a, just a dog owner? Then also as an instructor and as a business owner and as someone who's in the community where people look to and be like, hey, what are the fun things you're doing for us? You're like, with yeah. what time? <laughs> um, I would say like guilt is the biggest thing I feel at all times. I'm really trying. And it's funny because I know a lot of people um, see my Facebook posts. I try to post daily pictures of my walks with Daisy. And it's not, it's really just for me. So like a year now, you know, I have my memories of, hey, remember when we went here and we went there and I'm really just doing that for myself. But it's funny that so many other people are watching them now too. But boy, if there if two days go by that I don't do that with her, the guilt. And then Chewy just, I feel guilty on a daily basis. And I just tell her like, I'm sorry, but you're number two. <laughs> you know, If I have time, I will do something with you. Um, but Daisy is number one because she is 14. And then the same thing. Yeah, my students, like they, the more I offer, the more they want to do. So it's like, there's never enough, right? And and at any point I could just say, this is all we have and just take a vacation. But yeah, the, the constant guilt of, I could always offer more. There's more I could be doing. There's more. And then I was thinking too, more emotions. So what if I do get another dog? When am I, we just talked about this at the ORT, um, we hosted an ORT on Friday, and um, one of the competitors who I know from, and she's like, when am I going to see you on this side of the parking lot? And I'm like, when would I possibly be able to run my own dog, even if I had one that I could run? Right. Like, I just, you know, it, 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 so yeah, something, something needs to change, something needs to happen. And I'm sure a lot of other people, and like a lot of my students, they're doing fast cat one day, agility the next day, scent work the night. Like it's, we all need to just slow down. Like there is so much happening right now. Too many things. And I just listened to your podcast, uh, you know, talking on that subject. And yeah, we all need to just take a break. The dog sports will still be here tomorrow, you know? Right. And I think that that's why I really appreciate you wanting to talk about this topic because it all ties in, right? Mm -hmm. Where you had, again, we cannot just brush it off we all had this global catastrophe happen <laughs> where mm -hmm. quite literally life was on hold or was very tenuous at best and then everything kind of went away even though it didn't really go away but we really thought that everything was going to go away 
and then the opportunity to do things came back and everyone went full, you know, energy forward. Okay, I'm going to do everything because I missed out for however long that was. You tie that or couple that with the very tangible, finite amount of time that we have with our dogs. And it just exacerbates everything. And I think that all the dog sport opportunities are a wonderful thing for us, but it's almost too much. There's there's so many things to quote unquote make memories with mm-hmm. that are true that but then it's also like for a situation that like what you're finding yourself in where the dog is clearly tapping out and saying i'd like to make memories go running and pulling you in the woods please yeah. <laughs> but you have all that human stuff of but i could be in this situation at this dog sport with these co-patriots of mine, my colleagues and friends and whatever else, and we could be earning titles and I could be keeping my training chops. And I could personally be having, frankly, maybe more fun doing this than going out in the woods. And that's all really, really, really hard of you're literally almost at a fork in the road with your dog. Your dog is going one direction, you're like, but I really want to go down this way. Will you come over here, please? I'm like, no, come this way. Yeah. That that's hard. That's really, really, really challenging. And for me, being so disconnected from everything and just living on my computer, I can yeah. see what everyone else's journeys are, which is an interesting perspective to be in. And I'm seeing more and more people doing more and more things with their senior dogs. And it's almost like a frantic, desperate attempt to not miss out on something. Yeah. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, but what does the dog want to do? (laughs) Like, they're the ones that aren't going to be around much longer they should have a say. But then again, that's why I wanted to talk to you about this because I can have any kind of preconceived notion that I have. I haven't had to go through this. My sport dog died at six. Like I, it it was, I didn't have to go through all the things that people who have senior dogs have to go through, which is a lot. (laughs) You have, you know, canine Alzheimer's, you have all those health issues. You have like, oh my God, is the today the day? It's an awful experience to have to go through those things on top of all the the emotion of what's going to happen. All I spent all this time building this relationship and all these things to do with you. And now that potentially is coming to an end. That's so sad. It's just such an emotionally riddled thing. And that that's, you know, I really because I feel bad that I'm saying I Hmm. Not quite sure how I want to say this, but she, and I think you have to look at each dog because boy, being at trials so often, at, like almost every weekend, and I do see dogs that clearly do want do not want to be there. But I also see some older dogs that are like, "This is awesome. This is the best day ever." So it really does have to be a, a personal decision. But you have to honor the dog. It can't be what you want. It has, you really have to, when I saw she was bored, I'm like, I know she can do this. She doesn't want to do this. And that it's hard, but I think we really need to listen to our dogs when they say that, you know? And I think that's almost a more difficult position to be in than seeing the the dog who may has like a lot of arthritis and they have a really hard time getting around where you say, you know what, they're just not comfortable maybe getting in and out of the car. They can't physically make it through a whole trial day. That yeah. decision may be easier, right? Like, okay, clearly for the dog's comfort, I need to do something else with them. I would argue that you're in a much harder position because here you have this dog that can go on seven mile hikes, <laughs> has all this <laughs> stamina and all this go for something she wants to do. And that, yes, you have the training chops and the ability to build up her enthusiasm for the game again, do all these other things. But that's also that whole time thing of I could go in and do these training drills with Daisy, speaking on your behalf, and mm-hmm. we could do these things and probably, you know, change her opinion about this or I could go and do the thing that I know that she likes and that we can enjoy and make things together. But what I'm hoping people can can get from this is that that is a very conscious choice to make where the dog is literally taking precedence over, I really enjoy doing this training in the trialing piece. 
I give you a whole lot of props to that because that's that's probably the hardest part of being a dog owner. And yeah. it's constantly seeding those things because us with our big brains, <laughs> we can kind of see everything, right? We And we can appreciate what's happening tomorrow, potentially. The dog is living in the now, which is why they're so wonderful and so endearing and we love them so much. But because we can see ahead, we have to take into account what all the realities are. And sometimes that means that we have to shelf what we would like to do what for what's best for the dog. And again, I, I feel for you on all of these things, um, particularly when you, when you wrap up all the emotions as far as, well, what about my skills? And, you know, is it something going away? And what am I supposed to do? And the, oh my God, the guilt. <laughs> it should be like for anyone who's going to be an instructor or a professional in this industry at all. It's like, Okay, so here's your guilt card. You're going to be carrying this around for the rest of your life. <laughs> so how are you how are you getting through all of this? Do you find that certain things bubble up and then how are you coping? Are you coping? Are you doing okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're good. And so the one place where I am pretty lucky because I'm and I <laughs> I know this, I, I thought about this before we, we did the podcast, because I know your, your thoughts on trialing and you're like, oh, scary. And I'm like, <laughs> let's go to a trial, right? <laughs> um, so I'm lucky in that I host trials, I judge trials, I CO trials, I occasionally volunteer at trials. So I can still get that excitement of being at a trial because I'm at one all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so at least I'm not missing where I think it, that's the social part for a lot of people is they're missing out on the social aspect. So I would say to them as a trial host, everyone could use a volunteer, you know, or, or I'm sure your competitor friends could use someone to talk to that so that they're not talking with the other competitors in the parking lot. They can come back to the vehicle and say, Whew, this is what happened, you know, roll up your window so nobody else can hear and, you know, just talk about the search with a, a friend. You know, you could be that person or no one ever wants to work the parking lot, volunteer for a trial, work the parking lot so you can talk to everybody and still be part of that environment. Right. right. So, you know, if you're missing out on the social part, I know there's a million trial hosts out there that would love to have you. So, yeah, I'm lucky that I still get to go to trials almost every weekend and I enjoy it. When I see something that looks really fun, I'm like, oh, I wish I could run that. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit of you know jealousy and sadness and but hopefulness of hey in a couple of years from now I might be running that search right I I know that th these are not my last dogs I will have more dogs it's just not the right time so I'm just being hopeful I'm still trying to keep up my learning you know I'm still trying to catch webinars and and different learning opportunities wherever I can which I would do anyways just as being you know an instructor but from a competitor side I just we just had a um, an in-person workshop on mental mastery and oh my god it changed my life so I <laughs> use all the stuff from that workshop just in my it really is helping me just be more positive because I have been kind of down like oh I really want to go to a trial I really want to run a dog you know it just made me think of the positives which is really good so I'm trying and you know I just keep so busy that uh, I can't think about it too much <laughs> Yes, the, the 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 tried and true approach of like, okay, if I just bury my head in the sand and just bury myself with work, then the pain won't come. Yes, yes, I, I understand that approach. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, just seeing her so happy doing the things that she enjoys, I just try to relish every minute of that, even though it's not, I mean, I love walking in the woods too. It makes me feel better. But just seeing her happy, it, it, it's enough. It's enough. And that's something that maybe we can wrap up on is, again, being in the same working myself to death position of <laughs> you can be in the middle, or at least I'll speak for myself. I can be in the middle of like a mountain of stuff. I'm like, I, I need to do this. And then tiny little terriers would be like, hello. <laughs> and it's it's like tearing me away from the computer. It's like, no, but I was doing work. And then I'm, I'm upset. I'm like, God damn it. Like, I didn't have time for this. Now I'm going to be even more behind. What the hell? Like, and then off we go to do it. And within two seconds, I'm feeling immensely better. 
And I'm so incredibly thankful that he did that, that he pulled me away from the never ending work. And then it reminds me like, this is why having the dog is such a wonderful thing is that there's always going to be more work. There's always going to be more things that have to happen. And I think that it's wonderful that you have this opportunity with Daisy to do these things that get you away from the work, that you can be out in nature, that you can see her so joyful, the pictures that you post of her. And she's <laughs> just so thrilled with herself. And she's like, look, I'm standing on a log. But like, she's just <laughs> thrilled, right? That is amazing. And what an amazing gift that she's giving to you of this wonderful perspective of like, yeah, you know, there's all this other stuff going on, but isn't this great? And that's why dogs are just awesome. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Did you want to talk about that for a second for people who may be also struggling with that of maybe they aren't neck deep in dog stuff, but maybe they're neck deep in life stuff. Maybe they are struggling with all these different forks in the road that we've been talking about and they just don't know where to go. Okay. Maybe talk about how you've had Daisy help you figure out which way you guys can go. I mean, as you know, I have my hands in a lot of different pots and <laughs> I was literally, you know, not quite as bad as you. Cause I do sleep at night at least, um, <laughs> you know, I was every waking moment I was on my computer and there was always more to do. I could always find another project or whatever. And I just made a pact, you know, when our, our last dog passed away last year, I made a pact with her of, I'm going to dedicate an hour, at least a day, and we are going to do something fun. And it's not just walking around the block. Um, we, I call it adventures, you know, and it really, I feel like I'm almost more productive, even though I'm always behind, <laughs> but I'm, I, you know, I need that hour or so to just be in nature and getting my feet dirty and just, you know, watching her. And she just makes me, she gives me heart attacks daily because she likes to find all the cliffs um, <laughs> and just watching her do that. It's just like, why do you do that to me? Oh, you're doing that on purpose. I think you are, you know, she just makes me smile and it's, it really does help me get through all of the rest of the things. So yeah, maybe running in the woods isn't, isn't what brings your dog joy or brings you joy, but find what that is, you know, maybe it's, you know, doing, maybe it's a, a massage every day or brushing your dog every day, or maybe it is a walk around the block, you know, maybe it's going to a store and visiting with all the people at the store. Maybe therapy dog work is, is what's up your dog's alley and they enjoy that. And then it gives you that social aspect, right? So I'm sure there's a million other things that people can do to just have that one-on-one -on -one time. Even if it's one hour a day, at least it gets you away from all the stuff. Like I have so many students right now, like taking care of their parents and, or kids and just their life's, you know, they've got a lot of stuff going on. And then they come to class and they're like, this is like the best hour of my day. Right. So maybe it's not, I know we were going to do it. Uh, we have some other podcasts uh, scheduled. Maybe it's a different activity. Um, so I, I have, I, I won't give it all away, but, um, there's other activities that we do that, um, she enjoys that are safe, that are more fun than scent work right now. So we can, we can talk about those in the future too. Perfect. Yes. We'll keep you all at the edge of your seat. Like, <laughs> what are those things? Oh, don't worry. We'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so I really do want to thank you very much because it, it's, we're not getting into all of the details of this because, again, I think that these are all fantastic topics for us to delve into in, in future conversations. But I want everyone to realize that these kinds of experiences are common. And I really want to thank you sincerely, Lori, for talking about it because it can help everyone recognize that you're not alone if you're going through this in your journeys. You didn't do anything wrong. You didn't break your dog. You're not a bad person. Your dog's not a bad dog. This is all fine. And change can be very hard for a whole slew of different reasons. And I think it's helpful to just recognize that it is hard, but it's not impossible. And making these adjustments and things are okay. It doesn't make you any lesser of a dog owner or a handler or instructor or a nose work person. 
you're not going to lose your nose work license or your card because you know you made a shift because that's what your dog needs if anything we would be celebrating you from the sidelines They're like that was a fantastic choice that you just made for your dog and also for yourself because there's nothing sadder than seeing people trying to put that round peg into that square hole and it's just not working anymore and there's just frustration and there's all kinds of grossness and those are the last memories that you have with your dog doing this game that's not fun so i really do want to thank you sincerely for talking about these things because they're very very important was there anything else that you wanted to add just to wrap up i think i talked your ear off i think i'm good <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, I want to again, thank you very much. I want to thank Daisy and also Chewy for doing everything they do to help you keep yourself together. And again, sincerely on behalf of the entirety of the community that you provide so much for, we thank you, but we also want you to be around for a long time. So balance, my, my dear balance. <laughs> we'll get there. Yes, exactly. I want to give a very sincere thank you to Lori for sharing her story and for talking about this really sensitive topic about what she's been going through with Daisy. And I also want to give her her flowers for listening to her dog and also sharing the process that she's gone through, the emotions that she's had to process. That's what this podcast is really all about. It's trying to talk about these things more in the open so that we can all benefit. We can have more of these conversations with each other. We don't have to try to languish on our own. <laughs> and I really do appreciate Lori sharing this with us. And I give her again, the, the biggest amount of appreciation, admiration for recognizing the sense of really loss and grief that she had with having to make this decision, but at the very same point, listening to her dog. That is difficult and challenging, but wow, what a gift to Daisy. And it's not easy, but again, I tip my hat to Lori for both having this conversation with us and sharing with us how she was able to read and support her dog. That's amazing. So thank you all so very much for listening. Please make certain to give your pups an extra cookie for me. Happy training. We look forward to seeing you soon.